Hi, this is Albert van Aken. In this video, uh, I want to talk about radiative transfer modeling. Uh, and so, radiative transfer modeling is uh, one of the ways in which we can turn the uh, re reflectances that we measure uh, from the uh, uh, surface by the satellite, how we can turn that into real properties, real uh, characteristics of the surface or of the objects that we're looking at. And so, it's a pretty important aspect of remote sensing. So. Um, the first uh, thing we have to care about if we're trying to do that is the effect of the, uh, the geometry between the sun and the sensor on what we're observing. You see that in this image, which is uh, an image over the Gulf of Mexico uh, at the time of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that you might remember from uh, uh, about five years ago. And um, in it, you see a few important features. For, of course, you see the clouds, you see the cloud shadows. Uh, they're sort of the bane uh, of uh, for optical re uh, surface remote sensing. You also see the sun, its, uh, it's reflection, if you like, in the water. So uh, uh, within this image, you can tell that when the, the sensor looks this direction, it's got the sun in its back, uh, pretty much. And so you get this, this sun glint, and that's a challenge in its own right. You also see that the further away you move uh, in the image away from the sun, the less reflection you get. But you also see the effect of the oil spill here. Uh, which uh, acts to reduce the reflection by reducing sun uh, glint, essentially. Uh, uh, mostly it sort of um, um, creates a smoother water surface that is less mirror-like, I suppose you could say. So there's lots of features in here that really make it uh, complicated to get some, some objective measurement of the surface properties. Uh, and you see the same if you uh, sit in a, in a helicopter, in this case, and you uh, you look at a, the canopy of a pine plantation, for instance. And so what you see here is when you got the sun exactly in your back, uh, you don't see any shade, pretty much, because um, because you've got the sun in your back, uh, and so you're looking uh, the same direction as the sun is shining. Once you start looking away from the from that direction, you start seeing shadows, and that is a, 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 again. Uh, a challenge, but how do I interpret this image given that there's these sun uh, uh, geometry effects? Uh, and we call it a whole spot, by the way, that, that sunny spot there. Um, again, similar picture here, we're looking here with the sun in our back. We see less shadow than if we look towards the sun, we see uh, a lots and lots of shadow. In this case, we've got the sun in our back, we see uh, our own shadow here, we see some more shadows. When we look at the sun, we still see shadows, but we also, also see glint on the leaves of this uh, soy crop here. Uh, so again, you know, there's lots of uh, directional effects. We have to consider um, the, those interactions, and uh, that's usually captured by the term bidirectional reflections distribution functions. In other words, the, 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 uh, the, the um, uh, uh, combination of the sensor looking direction and the sun uh, shine direction, if you like, creates a distribution of reflectances. So if I've got a mirror-like surface, it's a pretty simple. Uh, it's a specular reflectance, uh, and it uh, may or may not arrive at the sensor depending on that geometry. Uh, if it's a, a rough, but uh, you know, otherwise um, not very uh, uh, relief-rich uh, surface, uh, like for instance, uh, water with, with some sort of waves on it perhaps, uh, then I get a, a, a more a sun glint type reflection where uh, most of the radiation doesn't reach us, but if the you know, if you look at the waves at the right way, you get a lot of reflection. So you get this glint effect. Um, in this case, if we look at vegetation, if we've got short vegetation, it might reflect more like a diffuse reflector. You know, it, it sort of reflects light in all directions. But if we get large ob objects like trees, we get clear shade uh, uh, and uh, and uh, illumination effects that can really um, uh, make the interpretation a bit harder. So how do we deal with these effects? Well, the first thing is, of course, to describe that effect with a theoretical model. Uh, and there's a lot of geometry involved, but other than that, it's not particularly uh, 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 you know, theoretically complicated, but it's a lot of calculations. Uh, and uh, so you know, one area where that's been um, sorted out quite extensively is in computer-generated imaging, um, so CGI you know, for animations and, and, and um, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, computer graphics that we see these days in movies and whatnot, computer games. Um, because that, to make that look realistic, you need to get that right. You need to get these, these, uh, these, sun, uh, these, these sun spots, if you like, uh, and these sorts of uh, reflections and whatnot. You need to, to get that right for people to you know, feel that they're looking at something um, that could be real. So you need to model that whole reflection process. 
that's what you see uh, done here with different sort of surface properties. So a fairly rough sort of uh, matte ball right down to a very shiny uh, ball. And, and so you know, the theory is all there, but it's to apply it is, a, is another challenge. And to apply it to vegetation canopies, uh, we tend to use uh, uh, first a forward model to understand how reflection would have to change with different uh, sun sensor geometries. Uh, and then uh, we use that model to uh, correct our imagery typically. Um, and um, I'm just showing some equations to give you a sense of what those equations look like. They're typically lots of um, tri trigonometry kind of equations. Now there's, a, there's been a clear development and a very strong development. Again, uh, lots of it uh, assisted by computer-generated imaging uh, 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 sort of developments from a very simple ball-like models or layer-like models or diffuse reflector-like models to you know, more realistically representing the distribution of elements uh, right down to the distribution of individual leaves and needles and branches and whatnot. And uh, that's what you see in this picture here. You know, obviously, it's got a lot more complexity, a lot more realism, you could argue, than, uh, than these uh, early models. And so we can do lots of virtual experiments on how reflect, uh, the reflections would vary as a, as a function of angle and, and vegetation properties. And some extreme example, if you like, here, from, uh, from CGI. Now, this was not done for the purpose of remote sensing, you'll appreciate, but you can see that, you know, how far we've come with um, with simulating effects like uh, like sun and shade effects, uh, haze here, sun glint on the water surface, uh, uh, shadows cast and reflections on the water surface, uh, right down to translucency of the leaves with the sun behind them. Um, so, you know, the, 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 there's been quite an in impressive increase in our ability to uh, model you know, the, uh, the effects of sun sensor geometry. Of course, um, in environmental remote sensing, we want to take a step further. We don't want to just model how it might look. We want to uh, use information how it actually does look as observed by the satellite sensor and infer uh, uh, backwards, if you like, what that means for the original properties of the vegetation. So we might be interested in things like leaf area index, how much is the leaf area per unit ground area. Uh, we might want to know things like um, uh, what is the uh, chlorophyll in the leaves, which is, you know, we need to have the, the, spectral, the spectrum of, uh, of chlorophyll and water and dry matter and so on, and try and uh, predict how that would look uh, as observed by the sensor as a function of the geometry as well as the spectral uh, uh, behavior, spectral signature of these different constituents. So again, we can forward model that, but we want to then somehow use that forward model to work backwards and 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 say, well, given the outcome, what what were the inputs? What was the uh, uh, the condition of the vegetation? And that's uh, we, we use models like Prospect uh, uh, is one of those uh, that's quite often used, where we uh, create these uh, these spectra uh, uh, as a function of of uh, different constituents. And we say, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the, uh, the input might be the chlorophyll has got this signature here. Uh, the, uh, the water might have this signature here. Uh, the uh, the um, structure of the uh, mesophyll cells, we'll talk about that later, uh, gives us this sort of reflectance process. And then if I combine them all, given their uh, concentrations, uh, then I should see uh, something um, you know, uh, uh, at the satellite, be it MODIS, for instance, uh, with reflectances in the different bands here on the x-axis uh, and the uh, reflectance values on the y-axis that look something like that. And so I can do this lots of times for different combinations of constituents and, and uh, uh, leaf angles and leaf area and all that sort of thing. And I can make a whole library of, uh, of signatures like that. And then I can start looking at the, what we measure. So we've got the forward model here, we put everything in there, the sun angle, plant pigments and so forth, canopy structure, uh, and we predict some of the measurements that we would be making with the satellite. But then what we want to do is take the actual measurements that we have made with the satellite and work backwards and figure out what these must have been. So that's what we call inverse radiative transfer modeling. And uh, so how do we do that? Um, well, there's different ways of doing that. Essentially, uh, as I suggested before, you simulate a whole lot of different spectra. This could be, for instance, a number of spectra. Uh, and uh, and then you look at the observations. Let's say that those are the red dots. Then I'm going to find which of the uh, spectra that are simulated comes closest to what I've actually observed. So it's a form of model fitting. 
or, uh, or parameter optimization. And ways I can do that is with lookup tables. I can iteratively search for different combinations of input parameters, uh, Monte Carlo or optimization methods like genetic algorithms and so forth. So there's quite a different uh, number of ways that I can do that. But the goal is always to find out which, which inputs uh, would most feasibly lead to the observed uh, end result. And then uh, just a tiny little bit on uh, radio transfer modeling on the water, where you got to uh, also then add the uh, the um, not only the uh, uh, atmospheric properties but also the water properties. So you, you've got the substrate at the, at the at the at the bottom of the water, but between uh, between the atmosphere and that substrate, we've also got the water itself with all sorts of constituents in it. So. You get things like scattering, so you see that nicely. You see a color gradient, where you see this, this, the scattering of the uh, of the uh, of the light uh, with the little particulates, little little uh, particles in the water. Uh, uh, you get things like glint, reflection. So again, you need to consider those when you're looking at aquatic remote sensing. And so uh, uh, people go uh, under the water to actually measure what the spectral properties are there, and then uh, combine those with the properties of the water itself and try to work out. Um, ways of using satellite imagery to, um, to, to map out those different uh, uh, concentrations in the water and, and, uh, and surfaces uh, at, uh, underneath uh, at the bottom. All right, so that was a, a brief exploration of uh, radiative transfer and radiative transfer modeling.